Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner, GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value and then planning for your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's sellable, transferable, and then exit, help you exit on your own terms and conditions and successfully. A key planning issue in building and and protecting the value of a business is attracting, recruiting, hiring, retaining key employees. And that requires, of course, having in place an attractive employee uh, benefits package um, or menu. Uh, According to the 2022 Employee Benefits Survey Report, a few of the most popular benefits are health insurance, but also, of course, dental, vision, life, disability, any kind of insurance, paid time off, paid family leave, flex work schedule, of course, is big these days, professional development and education, uh, mental health benefits, and, um, and then no surprise here, retirement plan benefits. And when it comes to retirement benefits, this can even be more important to the most key and important people in your organization, because these key, because these key people who are your most highly paid uh, would often like to save more re- for retirement than they can by contributing to their annually to their 401k. And so a common retirement benefit considered and provided to key people in addition to participating in a qualified plan like a 401k, is what's called a non-qualified deferred compensation plan. Um, Of course, a non-qualified deferred comp plan can be instituted for an owner just like it can be for a key employee. Oftentimes the owner is is very much a key employee. Um, And so it can play um, a role as well, De- non-deferred comp can play a role as well in structuring a sale to an insider's or family. And so if at some point you consider implementing a non-deferred comp plan for one of these reasons or others, you will eventually hear your advisor team, someone on your advisor team, probably someone like our guest today or Walter, at some point reference Section 409A of the IRS code. Um, And besides me personally wanting to increase my understanding of 409A, uh, we decided it'd be a good topic for discussion as it can impact the steps that you take in attracting and retaining key employees with deferred compensation. And so that's our topic today, understanding IRS code section 409A and non-qualified deferred comp. And we're excited to have with us today our guest, Mark Canada. He's he's an attorney with Krieg DeVault based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Mark concentrates his practice in the employee benefits area, counseling businesses and individuals on a wide range of benefit issues. He has experience in the design and implementation of qualified retirement plans, including pension, prop sharing, stock bonus, 401k plans, uh, TAF Hartley funds, Section 125 capture plans, fully insured, self-insured health benefit plans, everything. In addition, benefits. In addition, he has a lot of experience in executive comp planning, uh, helping employers provide for their key executives through non-qualified programs, like we're going to talk about today, and advising them on the design, funding, and regulatory compliance issues. And again, so that's our focus today. Mark, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure. We're looking forward to this conversation, or at least I am, because again, you know, <laughs> as you and Walter and I dis- discussed it, you two were a little hesitant on this topic. Uh, I think it might get a little too technical, but I need to up my knowledge and game in the 409A. So if, even if we don't have any listeners, you're going to be benefiting me. And that's what it's all about, right, Walter? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate welcome it. to the podcast. Good to have you with us. I, I appreciate that, and yeah, I'm guessing there's at least three or four other people interested. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll plow ahead with that that understanding. But um, 
Yeah, I want to real quick before I forget, and we're going to come back to this, but but Pat, you frame this in the in the context of hey, we're providing some non-qualified deferred compensation to our key executives. And that's that is the heartbeat of 409A. But we're going to chat about there's there's some unexpected scenarios where 409 applies that you would not think of as a non-qualified. For instance, certain bonus plans, no intent to defer the compensation whatsoever. So we're gonna we're gonna chat about that. Um, but yeah, real quick again, it's a section of the Internal Revenue Code um, deals with with the timing of income tax recognition. That's that's the key in, in all of this. And uh, real quick again, as background, the impetus of, of this comes from the IRS's longstanding hatred of allowing employers and employees to control the timing of, of the receipt and the taxation of, of income. They've hated it for years. They lost battles year after year after year in court. So with the Enron scandal and, and some things that were going on with the deferred comp in that arena, uh, they finally convinced uh, Congress to enact 409A and uh, to, to quote curb the abuses that were going on in this arena. And as you all know, um, it's the typical uh, killing the fly with a cannon type of approach, right? So the, the targeted abuse, uh, the, the fix was much, much broader than what the abuse was um, designed to, or what they acknowledged as the abuse. So, so again, just uh, real quick by background, in essence, 409A creates rules that a business must follow when it makes any payment to a service provider in a taxable year after the taxable year in which the services are performed. So for instance, um, you decide that as an employer, look, um, uh, we're going to provide a, a, a bonus um, based on your services in the year 2022. You did a great job. We're gonna pay you money in 2023. That's payment of compensation for services performed in, in the prior year paid in the subsequent year. So 409A applies in that scenario. So we're gonna chat about exceptions, but whenever you have a payment made in, in a later year than the year that services are performed, you have to look at 409A. That's, that's kind of the bottom uh, line on that. Um, and if you don't comply with all the rules that we're gonna just highlight, then, then penalties apply to the recipient of the deferred compensation. So we're gonna, go into that a little bit uh, later. Uh, crazy or not, it doesn't apply to the payor, it applies to the payee, uh, these, these penalties. Um, I should mention that these uh, rules apply to both elective and non-elective deferred compensation payments. So in, in a lot of times what you'll have is uh, like in the elective uh, scenario, it, it's basically the, the payer gives the service provider a choice as the timing of payment. Okay, hey Pat, uh, you did a great job. We're gonna we're gonna pay you a bonus. Uh, do you want to get paid now, or do you want to defer it for a year, or two years, or five years? You you get to pick. Uh, that's that's the kind of the standard non qualified deferred election. I think that most people think of. The but but it does apply to non elective situations, um, and that's a situation where the the payer decides. Hey, look, Pat, <laughs> you get no choice in the matter. You did a great job for us this year. We're going to pay you the bonus, but we're not going to pay it to you for three years, two years, five years, whatever you know, kind of thing. Or when these conditions are met, but that's that's also um, a deferred payment subject to 409A. Um, and again, so when the employer just decides it, or, or sometimes in scenarios where um, the pay payee and the payer um, work it out together. So again, another example of that is, hey, Pat, we want you to join our, our company. Uh, we're excited to have you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a, a sign-on bonus, right? And, and uh, we're going to pay you $100,000, but but guess what? Um, we're only going to pay you 50 now, and then you're going to have to work for us a couple years. <laughs> you know, Then we'll pay you the second half after you've been here for a while. Uh, that would be another scenario and, and we ne negotiate that, right? Well, I'd rather, you said five years, how about I get paid in three years? Okay, great. So half now, half in three years, that type of scenario, 409A would also uh, uh, apply to. And, and I would say that a lot of times it's that, that non-elective 
scenario that the people don't realize that the first scenario I think people are like oh I'm deferring compensation the employees electing they, they kind of get that it's the wait a second I just decided as employer what do you mean is subject to 409 I get that I get that all the time and so it does apply in that in that situation um let me let me give you an example um, where this happens all the time and people are get caught unawares um and that's that's in a bonus scenario, the one I sort of led off with. So uh, again, in, in 2022, we're, we're going gangbusters and I, I wanna push to make sure we finish strong in 2022. So I, I bring all my employees in and say, hey, uh, I guess what, I'm gonna pay you a bonus um, in, in 2023, uh, but I'm gonna pay you a bonus. So keep plugging hard, finish strong the end of 2022 and, and I'll give you, 5% of the, the net profits for the year. Um, and I'm gonna split it evenly amongst all you employees. Uh, so I'm gonna create a 5% pool of, of net profits and I'm gonna distribute that in, in 2023. But you know what? I didn't get the information, I was 2023 and I didn't really get the information into Walter on a very timely basis. So he can't calculate what my, my net profits are. And, and so it kind of goes along, goes along. And uh, then lo and behold, in, in June, we figure out what the net profits are. And as promised, I, I pay that, that bonus out. Uh, well, that, that, that delayed bonus um, was a deferred compensation payment, right? Paid based on services in 22, paid in 2023. Uh, there's an exception and a short-term, it's called the short-term deferral exception. Um, where 409A doesn't apply, but for that to apply, it has to be paid in uh, basically the, the middle of the third month of the tax year um, following. So in this case, March 15th of 2023 is, is when I have uh, the payment date. If I, if I make the payment before March um, 15th of 2023, I qualify for the short-term deferral exception under 409A, and I'm not subject to any of the 409A rules. But again, I don't get the payment information, the profit information, the financial information, the Walter. So we don't get, people don't get paid until April 15th or June, as, as I said. Um, that's a 409A. You don't qualify for that exception. So you're subject to 409A. And um, my guess is, uh, again, real quick, um, one of the requirements, we'll go through some of the basic requirements in a, in a minute. But one of the requirements is that deferred compensation program has to be in writing. Well, I, I didn't I didn't put it in writing. I just told everybody. I gathered everybody together and said, hey, this is this is great and we're gonna do this. Um, and so we just buy it, we violated 409A. I mean most employers would not realize that 409A applies in that that type of scenario. Um, and again we can walk through some of those examples, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right here, Pat, for you. Uh, to, to ask you, does, does that sort of get mm -hmm. the gist of this? Does that make sense so far? Any questions so far? I'm going to get into yeah, some more yeah. examples on this bonus thing, but. Yeah, yeah. So I probably have some questions, but I think uh, Walters are going to be more informed and more helpful than mine at this point. Walter, do you have a, a question before I launch out there with one? Well, I think it's going to be helpful to go through so, a few scenario or examples. Okay. And kind of address questions that way. Sure, let me let me do that. So let's go back to our bonus situation because that's that's kind of I think everybody understands that. Yeah. It's, it's pretty easy. So, so my example, the the employer announced in 2022 that he was going to pay a bonus in 2023. So services performed in 22 paid in the following tax year. So all right, hey have, Mark, I got you have to look out for 409A. I got a question about that real quick. Yeah, when he makes that announcement. Does he have to announce or or uh, indicate his plan to give half of it now in cash and 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 defer yeah. half of it? Yeah. So so good question. So the uh, the the issue with four hundred nine a is that um, basically that that time of service um, and the and the the payment date is um, triggered based on whether or not the the, the service provider the employees in this situation have a legally binding right to the payment in 2022. So for instance, if the if the owner came in and said, hey everybody, you're 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 doing great. And yeah, you know, 
my goal is to pay you a bonus at some I'm not I'm not sure exactly what it'll be I'm not sure but I I plan to pay you you know a bonus in 2023 based on profits I would argue that that is not definitive enough to to create a legally binding right to compensation in 2022 so then in 2023 when he makes the payment he's just making a payment I mean there's it, there, there's no uh, legally binding rights to the compensation in the prior year. They don't get the legally binding right until he actually pays them, right? It's, hey, Pat, uh, I'm going to pay you a bonus eh, whenever I want, however much I want. Uh, you have no legally binding right to that that payment, right? So then when I actually do pay you um, five years from now, I say, you know, okay, Pat, you've, you've done great. I'm going to pay you that bonus. You, you're, you're, you're not taxed. I mean, that 409A doesn't apply in that scenario um, because you didn't create that legally binding right. So the, the promise has to be yeah, definitive enough that the average person would say, yeah, I understand what the, the right is. And OK, I, I, I could sue in a court of law and win. You don't pay me my 5% bonus in my example, my first example, then I could sue you and, and win. So that's that's the scenario that, that would apply. Sorry. Yeah. So then it sounds like then if you've got something in writing, if you if you have indeed put the plan in writing, because you said the plan needs to be in writing. To comply with 409A. Yeah, to but comply it, it, with 409A. It, it doesn't have to be in writing to trigger 409A's requirements. So so what would happen in that scenario? Let's say again, I just I gather, I tell everybody orally, Pat. I promise you that I'm going to pay you 5% of the net profits in 2023 based on your services in 2022. I promise. I, I can't pay you now because I don't know what the profit amounts are, right? I can't pay you 5% until of 22 profits until 23 when I figure what they are, right? So, but I, I promise it can be oral. If it's oral, 409A applies because you have a legally binding right um, because uh, except in rare circumstances, real estate, certain other types of things, you know, oral contracts are are enforceable, legally enforceable. Okay. So in sense. a case like that, if four mm -hmm. uh, if four hundred nine a is indeed triggered, mm -hmm. first off, who knows it's triggered? <laughs> <laughs> Very few people. <laughs> and how do they? And how do they find out that it's triggered? And then. Once it, it's known and everybody knows yeah. what's actually triggered, what actually yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, good question. And and I will tell you, um, because again, the focus is on uh, exit readiness. And, and so I'm sure a lot of your clients and the, the audience listening um, in, in situations where they're going to sell, right? So, and then all of a sudden, everybody does their due diligence, right? That That's typically when these things are found out. I okay. do a lot of transactional work. And I get brought in on the employee benefit side. And so one of my first questions, whether I'm buying or selling, is talk to me, you know, tell me what kind of deferred con tell me about bonus plans, tell me about that, you know, and you uncover this. And of course, all of a sudden you represent the uh the buyer and you see, oops, they didn't comply with 409A and it's been a long time and they've done it with lots of situations. And now all of a sudden we're looking at huge penalties and non-compliance. So I'm not I'm not interested in buying your company or what usually happens is um you know you got to put in a big reserve uh you know uh, into escrow um and make sure until we get this issue resolved that that would be I'd say the most common scenario occasionally it's the you know IRS audit they come in and, and do those audits as we all know those tend to be fairly rare of course as soon as you say that then I get a call from a client that, oh, hey, right. you're getting audited. Um, I would say those are the two most common scenarios. Otherwise, people are just, you know, expression, fat, dumb, and happy, right? They, they paid the bonus. They didn't realize there was a problem, and, and life life goes on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good. Well, uh, you can keep going right now. Okay, those so... Yeah. So what goes what goes wrong in that, or what happens? Yeah, so, in that so so again, just to, to clarify, so that's the the one scenario. Uh, you would not have a 409A problem, and hence the violation. If again, as I mentioned before, 
you create that legally binding right in 2023. So after the fact, I come to you and say, Pat, hey, you did you did a terrific job. You know, so what I'm going to do, I'm promising you, um, I'm going to I'm going to pay just orally. I promise to pay you five percent of the net net profits as soon as I get the info to Walter and he figures out what that is. So I don't get the information until June, July. Walter calculates the profits in uh, in September of 2023, and I pay you in October of 2023. Um, that's fine because this is all happening. The legally binding right was created in 2023, and I paid you in that in that same year. So so no problems. Uh, it doesn't have to be in writing. 409A is not is not triggered uh, because so, there was no so payment the in the later year. Okay, so just so I'm clear, the violation happens if I make the commitment in 2023, either orally or written. 22. Or or, you make the commitment in 22 and, and you pay in 23, that's when a 409A violation could occur. Okay, all right, okay, got it, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and real quick then on the, on the penalty, so what happens if, it is bound out, and and uh, in, in essence, there's a, an excise tax um, that's applied, and uh, which is twenty percent of the um, the amount involved, which which is generally the the deferred the deferral amount, um, just for the sake of, of ease, and and also in all these examples that I'm going to give, and we're going to walk through, um, we're going to assume that the the employer or payors uh, payers tax year as a calendar year as well as the recipient is it makes it easier otherwise you got sort of convoluted scenarios um but but anyway what would happen is so we don't find out about this we did this we we paid you in 23 uh, that bonus and four years later the IRS discovers it and what would happen is because I violated we violated 409a I should have been taxed on that compensation and 2022 when the services were performed therefore basically i didn't pay enough taxes so i i have to file an amended return right i got to go back and i got to pay the excise tax and then i have to pay a, a a super a super interest rate uh, more than the average late payment of taxes uh interest rate on that on that amount um, so those, that's the basic penalty is uh, okay, and so earlier tax you, inclusion with an excise tax and penalties for late payment of tax. Okay, and so it's you, the employee, who's received the benefit, who has to file the amended returns and pay the and pay exactly, the, exactly. Oh, so, okay. but then guess what happens, right? Um, I come up to you, or you come up to me in my example and say, hey, "Mark, um, you know what you just did to me," uh, and. So you, I could have, by my failure as the employer to follow the rules, I may have uh, given you a cause of action against me. And so 99% of the time, what happens is, is the employer ends up paying the penalty, right, on behalf of the employee. And typically, there's a tax gross up, right, because my payment to you now five years later is as compensation to you and so that's included in income so it can get to be pricey the other thing with all of this is um once it's discovered um yeah i may i may have some employment taxes that as an employer that's usually not a big a big deal but but that's technically i could be zapped for some employment, late payment of employment taxes uh, as well, because it would have been included for income and employment taxes in uh, 2022, in my experience. Okay, so Walter and I, Walter and I are buying your company. Uh -huh. we, we're doing this to do due diligence because we don't want employees coming back to us at some point and saying, hey, you, you put me into this mess. I've got excise taxes mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to pay. I've got all these. And yeah. so there's risk there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that I'm going to be looking for that, right? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I was, I was working with one um, transaction a lawyer here at the firm, and uh, she got me involved in a deal. She said, yeah, I, I learned. I, 
I represented the buyer uh, and we didn't really nail that down. And bottom line, because it happened for a number of years and this and that, I mean, they, they were subject to, you know, potentially a couple million dollars of, of liability. Um, so, you know, it depends on the size of the deal as to whether or not that makes you, gives you any heartburn or not. But in this particular case, it was just uh, awkward. And, and, you know, uh, a couple million dollars is, is still real money, even if you're talking about a multi-million dollar deal uh, type of thing. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the rub. And, and uh, again, as, as you both know, you've been involved in these deals enough to know that what happens then when that problem is found out, um, you have to figure out what you do to, to fix it. And um, what you can do is there's, and we can talk about this a little more towards the end, but there, there is a, a correction program sponsored by the IRS where if you come in and fess up, uh, you can, in some cases, avoid the 20% uh, excise tax. In some cases, you have to pay the excise tax, but you don't have to go back and amend the tax returns. You just basically the employer just pays the excise tax and the super rate, you know, doesn't apply. Um, it depends on the type of entity, the type of employee, whether they're highly compensated, whether it's a publicly traded company, there are various rules in this correction program. But I would say that nine times out of 10, we end up agreeing that we're going to go to the IRS, again, confess and, and do this IRS correction program, and then it goes away. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, uh, so if you, if you find a violation, don't just stick your head in the sand. I mean, uh, uh, figure out what it is and and definitely analyze what the correction program, if it's available and what it would look like for you. Mm -hmm. So Mark, can we do an example of something we've run into recently a couple of times would be a deferred comp, mm -hmm. but with a, unknown price mm -hmm. so it's a deferred comp but it's like you're going to get five percent of the profits for the next mm -hmm. five years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does that throw a wrinkle into it or not really uh, it well it, it throws a wrinkle into it but that wrinkle can be ironed out i mean it, it okay. it's not an insolvable problem so so really again under 409a you you need to the the terms of the the agreement have to be in writing. I mentioned that. The other thing, you do have to specify, and I say this in somewhat in quotes, uh, the amount of the deferred payment or a formula for determining the amount. So you could say, hey, Pat, the sign in, well, I'm going to pay you $100,000, $50,000, 50000 in, in three years. We put that in writing. It's very clear, right? The, the amount and the timing of the, of the payment. Or we can do the bonus scenario where I promise to pay you 5% uh, of profits, uh, but I'm not going to pay you for a couple of years, but I put the formula in, that's that's perfectly fine if it's in writing and, and we jump through the, the right hoops. Um, so you you can draft around that. That's not, not a problem. But you do have to specify either the amount or the formula. You can't say, again, I promise to pay you $100,000, um, but we can negotiate the actual amount later because as soon as you negotiate that, you get right back into that. The employer and employee, I'll just say employer and employee, they have discretion in terms of the timing and the amount of payment that's, that triggers, that's a 409A violation. Um, so the, the amount of the payment or formula for the determining the amount, uh, you know, when it will be paid, and that can be either a date certain or it can be an event. Um, and I'm going to talk about events. Uh, I realize already we're getting uh, close to our time limit, um, but I will walk through those quickly. And then you have to specify the, the form of payment in the sense of, you know, is it a lump sum or installments? Um, I, I'll start paying you next year, you know, some maybe, maybe half, maybe 30%. Yeah, you have to be clear in terms of Again, sort of the timing and the and the form of, of payment, and and um, the rules, 
yeah, I have, have and the, what it means to specify a payment, whether it's deferred, all those terms have been defined and redefined and redefined again. And uh, I've got right next to me, not that I'm going to look at it. I've got about a three inch, three ring binder, binder in, with fine print um, that discusses the basic rules under 409A. I mean, it's just, it's tedious is is the only way to describe it it's just it's just tedious and you have to be kind of crazy to agree to be involved in this area what kind of uh, people you know, read this i you know dumb ones <laughs> like me um uh, uh, the last thing i'll say and then i do want to talk about some traps um again kind of crazy thing once those terms are set in writing then they they really cannot be changed. Um, again, the IRS was trying to prevent that very thing, right? They they don't want you changing these. They're limited exceptions. Never say never, but but they're very limited exceptions to being able to change. Even if both parties agree, you know, it's like wow, well, yeah. But the IRS hasn't agreed. So <laughs> once you create this thing, the IRS then becomes a party to your uh, your plan or your your agreement. Um, you want me to walk through? I want. I'm sensitive to the. Yeah, time. go ahead. Well, yeah, let me just walk through some of the traps. Just again, please. I, I, I sat. <laughs> I sat down, and in ten, maybe fifteen minutes, I came up with like three pages of oh, well, oh, you know, this is kind of thing, and that was just kind of off the top of my head. So, you know, the payment terms that throws everybody off. Um, so I'm going to pay you that amount. Uh, so you could only pay um, in one, two, three, four, five, six very specific scenarios. If, again, if, if service is performed in year one and payment in a later date, that the trigger to make that payment can only be six scenarios. One is a fixed date. Um, I promise to pay you in the year 2028, 20, you know. Um, or separation from service, say, Pat, I'll pay that bonus uh, when you leave, when you separate from service. That's a very tricky defined term. It's, it's not necessarily a termination of employment. It can be, but um, it's very specifically defined. Disability, Pat, you leave us because you're disabled, or you don't leave us and you're disabled, you know, then, then we, we can pay you uh, death, we can pay your estate or beneficiary, change of control. Um, and, and the last one is unforeseeable uh, emergency. I can accelerate the payment uh, in that event. Um, change of control, this happens all the time, right? Hey, you were anticipating a sale. We don't know when that'll be. So, but we want you to stick around, right? We don't want you to leave. So right. we're gonna create this bonus pool. You stick with us through the change of control, then we'll pay you at that point in time. Promise for certain. Um, Change of control is a is a very narrowly defined term that's filled with traps. So, for instance, especially with family businesses, um, you you can sell to a, an uncle and to a third cousin, but if you just go, you know, to a, a close family unit where the family attribution rules apply, then uh, you haven't you haven't really made a change of control. Uh, and, and change of control is defined based on, on stock ownership, uh, control, usually in a corporation through board seats or, you know, it depends on the type of entity, but, but control. And, and then the third scenario would be an asset sale. If you sell enough assets that could trigger, there's been a, a change in control and, and that would uh, trigger or allow a payment to be made um, in that scenario. I would say again, um, just, be, be careful, be careful, because this, I've seen this triggered, especially in, in closely held businesses where they sell some to the son and daughter, but and some to the outsider, you know, it, it, again, you just have to walk through that. Uh, I've seen that people get tripped up on that a lot. Um, another scenario I see a lot of times of, of people causing our problems is, I'll pay you on the earlier or later of, you know, I, I'll pay you when you separate from service. Oh, but if we have a change in control event um, before then, I'll pay you at that point in time. That that can work, but there's there's various what's called stacking rules. How you put those pieces together, you get can be four nine a compliant or or non compliant. So be careful if you're doing that. The 
pay you the earlier of or later of, you have to be cautious. Um, tying um, the payment to um, contingencies that create flexibility is problematic. Again, it can be worked through, but for instance, um, uh, I will pay you uh, this amount, but only if we have an income of this amount or only if sales exceed that amount um, or, or only if you work X number of hours. And again, the, the idea is, well, like on the last one, well, the employee can control, the employer can control the amount of hours. Oh, I needed a thousand hours. So I'm just going to work 999 so that I don't get paid until the next year, which then I'll work a thousand. So you just, you have to be careful on, on how you, you deal with that. Um, another thing real quick is uh, people always get messed up on legally binding right versus vesting. So when I promised you that hundred thousand dollars, Pat, um, uh, 50 paid now and, and 50 in, in three years, but only if you work for me for the next three years, um, that is subject to 409A. Um, uh, even though you are, are subject to a vesting schedule, right? You won't get, if you leave before that time period is, is up, you, you don't get paid. That is still a 409A deferred compensation arrangement, even if you don't get paid. So crazy thing is you don't stick around, um, but the plan violated 409A, you could be taxed on that $50,000 you didn't get paid and never will get paid. Uh, there's arguments as to why that shouldn't apply, but but that's the kind of goofiness that, that happens in this arena. So you just have to be cautious uh, about that, but that's a problem. Uh, another right, one. Mark, oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. Mark, I, I got me, more, uh, but go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you get three, pay, you get three pages. <laughs> no, no, and, and here's the point. Here's the big idea here, though, is <laughs> there's a lot of traps. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of traps. And so um, who our listeners, if they've got any kind of bonus plan in place, if they're thinking about deferred compensation, they really need to have some professional or professionals on top of this form because the, the people we work with, you know, they're using experts to stay on top of stuff like this. They're, they're not becoming experts in 409A themselves. This, this will give them, give them some ideas as to why they need an expert or experts on top of it. Um, typically, and, and Walter, you can speak to this too, does an accountant who's doing their 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 accounting and their tax returns, do they have the kind of expertise in this, generally speaking? Because a lot of times our business owners think oh, our accountant's on top of it. Uh, well, it's interesting because, you know, if you're, I mean, if I'm preparing a corporate tax return, for instance, I have no idea when all I see is they paid somebody X amount. I have no idea if this was part of <laughs> deferred comp or a bonus mm -hmm. or anything. Mm -hmm. So unless, unless the business owner identifies it as, Hey, I need to ask somebody about this. You know, they probably don't reach out. So if they do reach out, then it's, I mean, I could maybe tell them, well, just make sure you pay it by March 15th if it's just a basic, you know, bonus situation. Otherwise, I got to refer them to somebody like Mark because, I, you know, I don't know all the rules on this stuff. It's just way too complicated. And like Mark pointed out, if you screw up, there's pretty serious consequences. So, well, just, in particular, I think the whole thing is crazy, but I think a lot of stuff IRS does. <laughs> you're you're well, not alone in that, Walter, but anyway, yeah, that's, no, it's it, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so then you know they could get a big surprise, right? Yeah, in diligence when they go to sell to a third party. I think that's <laughs> what a good point Mark made is you may not even realize you have a problem until the other side in the due diligence process says, "Guess what?" That's not when you want to find out about it. No, and, right. And so, Mark, tell us, tell us, uh, tell the listeners. How they need to stay on how they need to stay on top of this. Who do they need to help them stay on top of this? Sure, I, I would say that what they need to do is, is again talk to somebody who's familiar with 409A and just have them do 
a loose audit, right? I mean, a few questions. I, again, the questions we ask in due diligence on a on a sale transaction will is usually enough to unearth this kind of stuff. And uh, and it probably doesn't hurt to do a general employee benefits. Another one. This is an aside, but real quick. Um, same idea. Um, they didn't do some things in the welfare plan arena that the deal was for $15 million. That was the sales price of the business. The penalty taxes and fees and fines uh, was potentially going to be close to eight, somewhere between eight to $10 million. What? The deal's worth 15 million. The potential penalties, eight. Let's just, let's be conservative and say eight. So needless to say, the buyer was saying, no, you got to fix not, this. We're not going to do fix this. It before, I mean, if you pick, and then again, thankfully we had a correction program we could apply. But a lot of times, um, yeah, periodically you just need to do that. And then if, if at any point in time, once you figure out your base, if you do anything different, uh, you know, let, let that person know, hey, we're thinking about making this change. Hey, we'd like to do it this way rather than that way. I get emails all the time. Is that okay under 409A? And yes, no. And a lot of times I can answer off the top of my head because I'm familiar with the plan. Other times it's like, ooh, yeah, that's a tricky one. I'll get back to you on that one. All right. So in the last few minutes, a couple things. Um, when you when you actually do due diligence, what is it that you're actually looking at? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm asking going back to Walter's comment, right? I mean, I'm asking the the employer. Okay, I see this payment. You know, talk to me about it, right? When when did when did you? Is this a part of a a written bonus plan that you have? A lot of times they have like a short term incentive plan. Lots of employers have that, right? That you have, it's it's in some form of writing um, that describes what this bonus plan looks like. Um, so so give me a copy of it so I can make sure it complies with with 409A. Uh, talk to me about employment contracts. Um, you, I mean, this isn't just dealing with plans of multiple, right? This is talking about deferred compensation. So it could be just one employee involved. Uh, and it could trigger 498. So show me your employment contracts. Um, yeah, it, stock bonus plan. I mean, it, it's, again, it just applies in crazy scenarios. A lot of times we can find exemptions, but but show me really your employee benefit plans, including bonuses, um, and then you know we can we can go from there. All right. Any last any last words of wisdom as we. Walter wraps us up here in a second. <laughs> this, see, this Ooh, was a good topic. This was a good topic. A lot of good stuff here. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't. Other than I mean, the, to any taxpayer, right? Any client that we have, right? You know, do your best. Be, be smart. Hire experts because you know, the penalties can come back to bite you later. And I, you know, I, I've been on the other side, I've run some businesses and I don't like to pay people money either, but um, you just need to do it in this arena because of the, the potential penalties. So Mark, how could, how can listeners get, get hold of you? Um, well, I actually am hiding right now because this gives me all a headache. And, uh, and right. so, uh, but, uh, but if, uh, they want to reach out to me, uh, that'd be fine. The best way is just email m m Canada, uh, m as in Mark, so m Canada at kdlegal.com. And uh, I'll respond. And if, if they could mention this program uh, that they heard it, that would be great, although I'll respond otherwise. But uh, yeah, that, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Okay. That's great. Thanks for joining us. You're a brave man to take on this topic on a podcast, but you did a great job. I think it opened up a lot of people's eyes. So thank, thank you very much for that. My pleasure. And listeners, if you want help in building a transferable business or planning for your exit, you can reach out uh, to me at grfcpa.com or pat at nslp.com or exitreadiness.com. Also, if you set up a free account at exitreadiness.com, You'll receive a 10% discount on any products purchased if you use the code PODCAST. Until next time, this is Walter Dial and Pat Ennis signing off.